Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? I'll just make sure I found my little next machine. Okay. So, this is quite brave of me because I've noticed there's quite a lot of Australians here. So, apologies in advance for that. <laughs> the deserts of the Australian outback are surprisingly well suited to Camelus dromedarius, or one humped dromedary camels. Camels' adaptations to arid environments include an incredible ability to conserve water and a highly flexible diet. They can eat 80% of Australian vegetation and obtain much of their water through the plants they consume, allowing them to thrive where other species perish. In many ways, the camel could be said to belong in this environment. Yet, for many Australians, camels are increasingly perceived as pests, vermin, and unwelcome invaders. As the feral population burgeons, camels are found more frequently on human settlements and agricultural lands, raising their profile and increasing local animosity towards them. Academics considering human perceptions of non-human animals frequently discuss how different cultures classify non-humans. Mary Douglas's influential book, Purity and Danger, suggested that those substances humans classify as dirt or pollution can often be understood as matter out of place. For example, soil becomes dirt when it is brought inside a human home. Douglas explored this concept in terms of food taboos. She proposed that anomalous species, those which fail to fit neatly into classification systems, become pollutants and consequently taboo. John Knight developed this concept by suggesting that species become animals out of place when they encroach upon human domains or disturb our perceptual boundaries of environmental order. Some species achieve this status by physically crossing boundaries, be they actual or symbolic. For example, rodents entering human homes become inedible pollutants, and hyenas disturbing grave sites are thought to physically desecrate areas of primarily symbolic importance. This paper argues that Australian dromedaries exemplify animals out of place and attempts to identify how and why they have developed this anomalous status. In addition, it proposes that ca the camel is not only out of place in Australia, but also out of time, in that its status has transformed in concordance with temporal shifts in human culture, circumstances, and worldview. So, dromedary camels were first imported into Australia in 1840 as part of colonial efforts to explore the Red Centre. They were recognised as the most appropriate transport species for the arid environment pioneers were attempting to traverse, and were highly influential in the establishment of Australia's modern infrastructure, notably the laying of the Darwin-Adelaide Overland Telegraph Line and the construction of the Transnational Railway. Once this infrastructure was in place, however, the camels were made redundant. They lost their value almost overnight, and large numbers were shot or released into the outback. These camels found themselves in a new environment with extensive similarities to their supposed environment of evolutionary adaptation, the deserts of the Middle East. They retreated to the sparsely inhabited Red Centre and the population flourished. To an outsider, it might seem that rather than being out of place, the camel is very much in place in Australia. In fact, the outpack supports the only known wild population of dromedary camels in the world. Yet over the past decade, the camel has become a source of contention and debate in Australian discourse. Now, dromedaries are on average six foot tall at the shoulder, <coughs> diminishing somewhat the effectiveness of cattle fencing as an obstacle. By some accounts, camels may not even see small fences and consequently walk straight through them. On other occasions, they will intentionally push through fencing to reach a water source, which they can sense from up to three kilometres away. In times of drought, groups of camels can cause significant damage to agricultural properties in their search for water. In such cases, camels are literally crossing physical human boundaries. For people in the affected areas, camels shift from unobtrusive desert nomads to physical transgressors, invading human spaces. Although camels rarely physically threaten humans, their large, group and bulk, their large group sizes and bulk intimidate human populations who may have received little information on how to cope with their arrival. Whilst these occurrences clearly affect those humans who experience them, they are perhaps less influential upon the general Australian psyche than the camel's most significant boundary crossing, which is into Australia itself. Given the substantial impact on the Australian environment of introduced plants, rabbits, foxes, cats, cane toads, Many Australians have widely negative perceptions of non-native species. Such species are commonly referred to as invaders and, as Kay Milton points out, cross two important boundaries. Firstly, they are alien or foreign, and second, they are often, often sim simultaneously unnatural because humans have introduced them. For those conservationists who, Milton suggests, aim to maintain nature in some ideal form, camels are literally out of place. So even to those humans who never encounter camels, as a species, they become classified as unnatural invaders of the Australian ecosystem and consequently as pests. 
Finally, the camel's greatest physical transgression is ironically their success in the outback and consequently their sheer numbers. The most recent report estimates that there were upwards of a million camels currently in the outback and predicts that this number could double every eight years. Many of the prominent environmental concerns about the camel's existence, such as soil degradation, are related to specifically to large numbers of camels. Individually, they are considered to be low-impact grazers. As Putman comments, quote, some animal pests are only pests when in inappropriate numbers or in the wrong context. The Australian dromedary wasn't generally considered a pest species until recently, and it appears that an increase in numbers has caused it to be reclassified as such. Arguably, then, the camel's status as an introduced species, hitherto ignored or even celebrated, has been transformed by its transgressions, which, though relatively minor, have caused camels to be tarred with the same brush as Australia's other more infamous introduced feral species. Thus, the camel's physical boundary crossing may also have consequences for their symbolic categorisation. As Douglas recognised, the camel was a classificatory anomaly even in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, camels, because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof, are considered unclean. In Linnaean taxonomy, camelids are distinct enough to warrant their own family, camelidae, containing just seven species compared with 140 species of cattle. Camels are also symbolically out of place for many Aboriginal peoples. Unlike native species, because camels have been introduced, they have no dreaming or totemic links with people and country. The dromedary also holds anomalous status on the continuum of wild domesticated. It is thought that camels may be an example of a species that was or is tame in the wild. While a wild type may simply have become extinct, given the accumulative nature of nomadic pastoralism in the Middle East, it is also possible that wild dromedaries were assimilated into existing herds. Indeed, they are likely to have been a preferred domesticate because of their pre-existing adaptations to the desert environment and may have been little altered by human selection. There are two salient points here. Firstly, dromedaries are a classificatory anomaly, or at least distinctively classified, across cultures. Secondly, there is a potential lack of real-world distinction between a wild and a feral dromedary. Feral is defined as in a wild state, especially after escape from captivity or domestication. Ingold suggests that the definition of a wild animal is essentially one that is out of control, and that feral animals are therefore likened to convicts on the run. However, as most of Australia's population of wild camels have never experienced human control, um, there, and their designation as feral is perhaps misleading, especially as there is no wild type with which to compare them. The camel's designation as feral is therefore more symbolic than descriptive. Yet the classification persists and is influential. Compare the Australian dromedary with the true two-humped wild camel in the Gobi Desert, which has recently been granted additional conservationist protection because it has been identified as a distinctly separate species from the domesticated Bactrian camel and is no longer simply a feral cousin. Australian dromedaries, however, retain, remain a symbolic anomaly between wild and domesticated and tend to be perceived as animals that can and should be under human control. In his book Hunters, Herders and Hamburgers, Richard Boullier introduced the concept of the post-domestic society. Firstly, post-domestic citizens are physically and psychologically distanced from most of the animals they depend on and are not involved in the processes by which these animals are made consumable. Secondly, this distancing causes feelings of guilt and disgust when post-domestic peoples are required to confront and consider the aforementioned processes, which is done as seldom as possible. In contrast to post-domestic societies, Boulier described traditional pastoralist societies and noted that within pastoral groups, many day-to-day -day transactions are based on the societal convention that animals have value as living beings regardless of the products their bodies might yield. Whilst these are gen clearly generalisations, I feel Boulier's analysis reasonably describes the typical post-domestic citizen and nomadic pastoralist society and are therefore useful for the purpose of this discussion. The transformation to domestic societies, Boulier argues, began in North America with the market economy in which small numbers of people pastured enormous numbers of livestock on vast tracts of land for the purpose of sale. Consequently, the landers, landowners or ranchers perceived animals primarily in terms of money or goods received in exchange. Post-domestic societies are described as the seeming in, seemingly inevitable conclusion of this trajectory, in which animals are perceived, processed, and sold as commodities. It is Boulier's ranching rather than the traditional pastoralist model that became established in Australia. Large numbers of European livestock, particularly sheep and cattle, were introduced and grazed across vast ranges. From this foundation, Australia has developed into a textbook post-domestic society, with the majority of the population living in urban areas and far removed from the herding, mustering and slaughter of the country's livestock. The Australian camel, once again, does not fit into this picture. It is currently understood that dromedaries were domesticated in the hot deserts of the Middle East between two and 4,000 years ago. 
It is impossible to describe here the extent of the camel's various utilitarian and symbolic roles throughout Arabian, West Asian, and North African history. Suffice it to say, it is difficult to overestimate its importance, particularly for desert pastoralists. Removed from desert pastoralism, however, once Australia's dromedaries had fulfilled their original purpose, they retained no intrinsically valuable status. Consequently, feral camels faded into the desert and out of human society for the first time in hundreds of years. It was not until the 1980s that surveys of Australia's interior hinted at the true extent of the camel's population growth, and only in 2001 that reports of damage caused by camels were brought to the general populace. Over the past decade, media coverage regarding feral camels has increased and is predominantly negative. In 2008, these reports culminated in a government-commissioned report and publication by Edward et al., intended to assess the impact of feral camels and human attitudes towards them. The researchers aim to record the perspectives of key stakeholders in feral corral management. Ranchers, conservation managers, and Aboriginal peoples, notably the camels themselves, are not recognised as key stakeholders in their existence. Although there were variations in methodology, one trend was clear. A utilitarian attitude prevailed. Camels were perceived as pests primarily because of the economic damage they caused to the infrastructure of properties. The only positives investigated by the surveyors were also economic, this demonstrates the economically focused and post-domestic attitude held even by objective researchers. Another significant concern, also enforced by media reports, was that feral camels compete with livestock for food and water, although this has not yet been confirmed with researchers. Again, this highlights a post-domestic attitude. Much of the camel's territory overlaps with that of cattle. Both are introduced species, yet cattle retain their economic value to humans as part of Australia's red, red meat industry, whereas camels do not. In competition, Cattle are protected as valued domesticates, and camels, now outside the human sphere, have become pests. Economic considerations also thread through much of the debate surrounding how the growing population should be managed. Recently, a large-scale culling operation began. There have been objections from animal welfare groups who are concerned that the method of culling is inhumane. Most objectors, however, are primarily concerned that culling is economically wasteful. They feel that the camel should be mustered for slaughter or export. Aboriginal peoples were also reportedly supportive of the camel industry, or if necessary, culling, but primarily because they are concerned with the well-being of country. This concern stems from the predominant and persistent belief that camels are a significant environmental threat. Edward Hittal's report argued that in large numbers, camels significantly damage vegetation and degrade the ground, impacting the balance of local ecosystems. Camels also produce methane, contributing to Australia's carbon emissions. I do not debate the accuracy of these assertions, but it is important to note that the environmental impact of even a million feral camels pales in comparison to that of the 26,500,000 thirsty cattle currently residing in the country. Yet, following reports of dust storms gathering over Sydney, it was the camels who were blamed for increased desert desertification of country. I present these biases to underline the impact that the camel's anomalous feral and invader status has on its standing in public perceptions. It is cynical, but not unreasonable, to suggest that the camel's status as an out-of-control invader allows disproportionate blame to be placed upon it, thus making it a problem that can be managed. This is perhaps easier than acknowledging the true impact of a post-domestic system of large-scale animal production and consumption without restraint in a country that is poorly suited to the pressures placed upon it. What is almost entirely absent from this discourse is any direct study or consideration of the camels themselves. Hang on. There they are, <laughs> who are arguably also key stakeholders in the debate. Although culls and management will reduce numbers, the outback is clearly an ideal place for camels to thrive, meaning these solutions are inevitably short term. Ironically, despite the autonomy and agency of camels being largely ignored in discussions about their position in Australia, it is this same autonomy, the ability to thrive without humans in one of the world's harshest environments, that has inspired the debate. The Australian camel through the eyes of hu through human eyes is an animal both out of place and time. It is physically and symbolically anomalous, no longer has economic value in Australia, and is not supported by a pastoralist heritage. For dromedaries, however, Australia is the only place where their actions are neither controlled nor directed by humans, where, indeed, retreat into the harsh desert climate serves to protect individuals from those who would hunt them. Even in the face of extensive culls, there is little doubt that the camels can and will continue in the Australian desert, where humans cannot be in a place they have made their own. Thank you.